Hey everyone, in the last video we covered everything that you need to know about the theory of power when it comes to building robots. We designed a circuit on paper that you could use to power pretty much any kind of robot you'd want to build. Today we're actually going to build that circuit. We'll be wiring it up and looking at each of the different components. So by the end of this video you should have everything you need to go out and build one for yourself. A couple of things to note about this video. You might notice that a lot of my wiring might seem too long or too short. That's fine, this is just bench testing at the moment. When we go to actually install it inside our chassis, we can rewire things and tighten it all up however we want. You'll also notice that I like to use connectors and screw terminals and ferrules wherever I can, especially when prototyping. It might seem like using these things and wiring them all up actually takes more effort, but you quickly realize that it saves more time when you're trying to prototype and rearrange things and try out different ideas. So let's go wire it all up. So by the end of the last video, we had this circuit planned out. If you haven't seen that one already, you should go back and watch it first. So we've got 12 volts coming in from a battery, going through a fuse and then to a switch. From there, it splits off into a five volt regulator to supply our different components. And then the other pathway goes down to our motor driver to supply our motors. Let's start with this battery switch section up here. You can see we'll need a connection to our battery and then to the fuse, and then to the power switch. So this is the normal way you'd lay out that circuit. You can see here we've got the XT60 connector. That's a pretty standard connector for going to our battery. Then following it down, we've got this mini blade fuse holder. That's the kind of fuse that you'd normally find in your car, that sort of thing. Now I'm using an inline one. You can also get panel mount ones that make it easier to change the fuse. Uh, but if you're having to change a fuse that often, you're probably doing something wrong. And so I've got a 10 amp fuse to go in there and then following it along some more, we've got our switch. Now this is a pretty normal way to do the switch. It's just sitting here on our supply voltage line and then as we turn the switch on, that's gonna close the circuit and let the power run through. Now that'll work, but I've got a slightly more complicated switch that I wanna use. You can see it's got an LED on the end of the switch, which is nice to have, but in order for it to light up when the power is on, it's gonna to need to properly close the circuit with a connection to ground. That means our switch is gonna have three pins instead of the normal two, and we'll have to make sure each one is connected correctly. So then, whenever the switch is closed and the 12 volt line is active, the light is gonna be turned on. So here's the circuit with the other switch in there. Now there's a few ways you could go about wiring this up. Um, I'd actually meant to get a new switch and wire it up with spade connectors, but I forgot to get it in time, and so instead I've pinched the switch from the prototype, and this one, I've already got a little bit of terminal strip here that's doing all the hard work for us. So it's a bit funny, but hopefully you can see we've got positive and negative going in and positive and negative coming out. The two positive lines are connected to either side of the actual switch switch. And then the negative lines are connected to each other and also connected to the ground pin of the switch to make the light work. I'm just gonna wire these up in a quick montage. All right, so we've got our fuse and our switch wired in. We're just about ready to plug in our battery, but first I'm just gonna check continuity, make sure that our circuit is working the way we want before we put our battery in. So with the switch off, our two positives aren't connected to each other. They're also not connected to ground, but the two grounds are connected. And then with the switch on, our positives do get connected to each other. So that's great. Let's switch this over to voltage. Now, oh, we'll turn the switch off, plug our battery in. We can check on the output, the voltage between positive and negative is zero. And then when we turn our switch on, hopefully you can see the lights turned on there. It's a bit hard to tell on the camera, but when we measure the voltage across the output, we're getting 11.84 volts. So that's the charge that's in our battery at the moment. So that's great, it works. So before we move on, we want to switch off our circuit and unplug our battery. Now, here's where I'm going to give you an interesting tip, uh, maybe a bit dodgy on the safety side of things. I find that unplugging XT60 connectors can be really difficult. They can be stuck so tightly together 
and you're there, you're pulling and pulling and it end, ends up taking so much force that you rip the battery out and you end up potentially doing more damage. Now, the trick I like to do is you can actually make these easier to open. And to do that, all you need to do is get a pair of needle nose pliers and just gently squeeze the pins. I've already done it on this one, but gently squeeze the pins slightly closer together. And by doing that, you'll make it heaps easier to plug in and out. So you can see I can do this pretty easily. You don't want to squeeze them too tight or it'll actually stop making connection. Your battery will drop in and out. I've had that happen. Um, or at worst case scenario, the battery will literally fall out. Um, but if you make them just a little bit smaller, then you should be able to unplug and unplug much easier. I wouldn't do this on something like a drone where you don't want the battery falling out while it's in midair. But for something like this, um, I, I personally find it safer um, doing that than ripping the battery out with all the force. But you know, it's not right. You shouldn't do it, but I like to. Checking our circuit diagram again, from here we can see that the power needs to go out from the switch, firstly to the regulator, and then also to the motors. You might think that we need to make a splitter, and that's exactly what I did in the prototype, but this time I'm going to take advantage of a feature in the new regulator. You see, when they designed this regulator, they knew people were going to want to do exactly this kind of thing with it, and so they built a splitter into the board. So our supply voltage is going to come into this set of screw terminals, and then that same voltage is going to be able to come out from this set of terminals off to our motor driver. We'll look more at that in the next video. Now this regulator also has a couple of other interesting things going on. Uh, yours might be a little bit more boring like this one that's just got uh, two leads in and two leads out. But for this one I've got here, it's also got an on off switch that you can use to turn it on and off. And then it's got this other little switch that lets you switch it between being five volts and being a variable voltage that you can set using this trim pot with a screwdriver. Now we just want five volts, so I'm gonna leave that switch in the five volt position and I'm gonna leave it on. Okay, so we've got the new regulator wired up into the circuit. Now we want to check if it's actually putting out 5 volts. The question is, where does the 5 volts come out? On this simple regulator, it's pretty easy to tell. It's got 12 volts and 5 volts labelled. On the new one, there's actually four different ways that the 5 volts comes out. We've got this screw terminal here, this connector here, and then these two sets of header pins. So there's four 5 volt pins and four uh, ground pins. I'm going to focus on this screw terminal here. So I'll be putting my probes on there. So we've got zero volts out at the moment. We can turn the circuit on. Hopefully you'll see the little light comes on here on this regulator to tell you that it's running. And now when we measure the output, we can see 4.85 volts. Now, to be honest, I'm not that impressed with that, uh, but it is within 5% of five volts. So it should be right to run the Pi and hopefully all our other devices too. Now that's all well and good that we've got five volts out of this, but we actually need to get five volts to a whole bunch of different components. Now, if you've got a regulator like this, then that's gonna be really easy because it's got all of these other ports coming out. But in case you've got one of the simpler ones or you just don't wanna use them like that, we need a way to be able to split our five volts here into all the other places we need it. Now, there's a bunch of ways you can do that, but I'm gonna show you the way that I've done it, at least for testing. Okay, so now I've got this piece of terminal strip wired into the regulator and you can see I've got every second pin joined together. So all of the reds are joined together and all of the blacks are joined together. And what this means is that we can switch our circuit on and now if we check any pair of adjacent pins, we should see, we should measure our 4.85 volts, even all the way up at the end here. And so now we'll be able to connect all of our devices into here, um, especially while we're testing on the bench. When we put it into our robot, we might wanna kind of shrink this all down a bit, but it's great for during testing. Okay, so now that we've got all of the five volt points that we need, it's time to power something up, and I'm gonna go for broke and start with the Pi. Now, technically you're only meant to power the Pi through the USB port, so if you want, you could make up a USB cable that goes from here to our regulator, but since we're going to be wiring up so much other things anyway, it just makes sense to wire it directly into the 5 volt pins. But you can do whatever you want. Pin 2 and pin 4 on the headers are both 5 volts and there's plenty of ground pins to go around. So to connect to them, if you've got some thick enough cables uh, with female headers on the end, you could use them. But instead, I'm going to be using this little cable, which I nicked off the prototype. 
It's got an RC wire connector, which is designed to be used with its female counterpart. They connect together, but it happens to be just the right spacing that I can connect that there. So I've got the red connected to pin four and the black connected to pin six. You can buy these with wires already connected like I did, or you can crimp your own. Now it's the moment of truth. If you want, you can get your multimeter out, you can check, double check, make sure everything's gonna be right, but I'm just gonna go for it, I'm gonna switch it, and hopefully our Pi turns on. To check it's working, you could plug a display in, but instead I'm gonna try logging in via SSH. And there we go, we're in. And then make sure we shut it down from the terminal before we switch the power off. I do plan to make a safe shutdown switch at some point to get around that, uh, but I'll save that for another time. That's the Pi sorted out. One other thing we've got to do is wire in our USB hub. You might not need this if you don't have as many high current USB devices as I do, but it's worth listening in anyway. I'm using this little hub that I got from Adafruit. It seems to be pretty popular. It's got a little DC barrel jack on the side, so you can wire into that if you want, or you can crack it open and wire straight into the pins. It's worth noting here that Adafruit actually recommends that you open it up and cut the five volt line to avoid backfeeding power into the USB ports of the Pi. Now I can absolutely see why this might be a concern if you had a different five volt supply for the Pi and for the hub, but since they're both coming out of our regulator, it's the same voltage. To the best of my understanding from what I've read online, it is safe to apply the same five volt source to the Pi's power in as well as to its USB ports but I don't know the full implications of this, so do so at your own risk. If you are worried, you can get in there and cut that wire. I've also opted to make this little cable so that I can plug it into the DC jack, but if you want, you could open it up and get in there and solder straight to the PCB. So let's wire this in. One last little thing, this Pi case that I'll be using has this fan that came with a double female header, but the problem is we've already used our five volt and ground that are next to each other on the Pi's PCB. So in order to get this to work, I've pinched a couple of single female headers from a different cable that I had and stuck them on the end here. So we should be able to wire this in as well. My fans aren't screwed in yet. I'll be doing that when I properly install the case. If you don't want to split it up, you could also connect it straight into the regulator, just like we have with everything else, but that seems a bit overly complicated. So let's just double check that we haven't broken anything. Fans are on, the Pi is on, USB hub is on, everything's working. One last thing I forgot to mention is that throughout this video, I've been using a battery as the power supply for this circuit. In reality though, when you're doing bench testing and prototyping, you probably want to be using a, a mains powered bench supply for this. The one I've got here is actually an old computer power supply built into a toolbox. And what I like about it is it can do a lot of current over 30 amps at 12 volts. So I've got an XT60 connector wired onto it, just like the battery. And then I've got this power switch. It's another one of those LED power switches, but this time it's under the missile cover so you can turn it off more easily. And once that's on, we should be able to turn our circuit on just like we could with the battery. So that's our power circuit. We'll be able to use this for the next few videos when we add our motors, camera, LiDAR, and that sort of thing. We'll get it all sorted out, and then anything we need to rejig, we can do that when we go to assemble it into our chassis. If you've got any other ideas, drop them in the comments. Otherwise, I'll see you next time when we get our motors ready to work with Ross.